Right. Um, well, welcome, folks, to uh, this uh, this session um, on uh, Enox, a uh, an open source project which we're very proud to be presenting. Um, I'm uh, Mike Lassell. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the project, and with me is Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Hello, everyone. Welcome from the lake. Yeah, Nathaniel is is on PTO. He's actually taking some leave, so he's dialed in from the lake. So. Um, if you hear lapping of water and feel very jealous, um, that's what it is. Um, I encourage you to um, make the um, the slides as big as possible. We're going to have demo um, uh, slides in a bit with uh, fairly small text. So um, uh, we will walk you through them, of course. But uh, if you can make them as big as possible, double click on the uh, on screen and, and uh, that should help. Right. So um, well, let's let's carry on. So uh, first of all, a little bit of an overview of Enox. Uh, Nathaniel, please tell me if uh, the slides aren't moving on. I, I assume they are. So just a, a five five bullet overview to, to give you a, a, a basic intro. We, we want to focus really on the technical here, but I want you to, want to, to know a little bit about it. So the first thing is that Enox uses TEEs. That's Trusted Execution Environments. Um, some examples are SDX from Intel, SEV from AMD, uh, the recently announced TDX from Intel. Um, and what we what they allow you to do is to isolate workloads. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we want to help you to um, deploy confidential, uh, sensitive workloads using TEs. Another really important part of the project is um, we want to make it really easy to both develop and to deploy um, your workloads. Um, usability is really, really important to us uh, as part of the project. We have chosen some very strong design principles uh, in terms of security. Um, we want to make it as difficult as possible to do the wrong thing. We can't always force you to do the right thing, but we want to make it difficult to do the wrong thing, but easy, sorry, yeah, and easy to do the right thing. Um, cloud native, absolutely. You know, we uh, very much uh, hope to be. Uh, integration with things like OpenShift and Kubernetes. And um, this is, of course, all open source. And I want to be very clear, this is a project that is not production ready yet. Um, but we will have some exciting news uh, that we'll be announcing in the course of this, uh, this slideshow. Uh, and it's part of the Confidential Computing Consortium, which is a, uh, a Linux Foundation project to encourage use of TEs and open source. So that's enough uh, to be getting getting on with. Let's let's talk a bit about isolation. I want to set the scene. So let's assume you've got uh, you're do, putting stuff in the cloud, public cloud, private cloud, whatever. But let's say you've got some stuff in the cloud, and um, you, your tenant is on the on the right, and you've got you've got some workloads you want to deploy into a, uh, a host on a cloud, and You've got your workload, which is in yellow, and there's an, another workload from another tenant. And of course, there's the host uh, OS, hypervisor, all the other bits and pieces that, that a host uh, includes. So we've got three types of isolation. The first type is workload from workload isolation. So you do not want somebody else's workload to be able to interfere with yours, either stop it running or look inside it or change information inside it. That's a, that's a bad thing. Luckily, um, actually, we know how to do this. We've been doing this for, for a long time. I don't mean Enox. I mean just the community, the security community, uh, with things like um, VMs, with containers, C groups, all those sorts of things, uh, do a great job in actually stopping uh, this sort of thing. So uh, type one, we, we pretty much know how to do. Type two is protecting the host from the workload. If your host, if your workload is compromised or it's malicious, um, we really don't want it to be able to interact uh, maliciously with, with the host because <coughs> it can uh, alter what's happening on the host or maybe even break out into the other workload. This is sometimes known as breakout. Um, and uh, again, actually, this is something which we've been doing the community for you know, 10, 15, 20 years pretty well. We know how to do this, VMs, C groups, SE Linux, uh, all this cool stuff that Dan Walsh was talking about a bit before um, is, is how we do this sort of thing. So this is good. What I hear you cry is the third type of isolation. Well, that is protecting the workload from the host. This is a lot more difficult. So 
what if the host is compromised? What if it's malicious? Well, if you've got a sensitive workload, and by sensitive workload, I mean anything from customer data, credit card data, your CEO's pay, pay packet, um, some Hadoop machine learning, some pharmaceutical information, um, some uh, firewall rules, some cryptographic keys, all of those sorts of things. What if you want to protect that from the host? Well, this is a lot more difficult. Um, and the answer that the industry has come up with, uh, the chip vendors has come up with, is something called TEs, Trusted Execution Environments. These are chip-level instructions which allow you to set up uh, a, a special execution environment where basically all the pages are encrypted um, and so the rest of the host can't see it. So the only time they're unencrypted is when they're actually being acted on by the CPU or whatever's providing the uh, providing. Um, the uh, the environment. TEs, trusted execution environments. Um, so that's all good, well and good. So, but it this is what you need if you're going to use sensitive workloads. And there are lots of sectors who can't deploy many of their workloads onto the cloud because their regulators are unhappy about it. Healthcare, finance, government, whatever. But also, you know, what about vulnerable hosts? Well, if you're in the edge, maybe you've got machines which are vulnerable to physical tampering or, um, you know, dodgy networks. So you really want to be able to, to start making use of this. And this is what the NRX project aims to let you do. So, um, Nathaniel, why don't you talk a bit about this, uh, this slide? Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the key bit here is that the TEEs allow us to actively distrust the middle part of the stack. Uh, in other words, we don't have to include them uh, within our threat model uh, because they are, uh, they're external and they're protected by these TEEs. So uh, our principles are pretty simple here. We don't trust the host. We don't trust the host operator. We don't trust the host owner. And then uh, we make sure as part of our software deployment that all the hardware that we are using is cryptographically verified and all of the software uh, that is in use is audited and cryptographically verified. So uh, pretty, uh, pretty much strong principles all around. Um, NRX is well suited to microservices. This is sort of uh, our bread and butter of what we would like to be able to tackle is to be able to put microservices um, inside these keeps, which is what we call our protected area. Um, this is also well suited to sensitive data or algorithms, right? These are generally things you want as microservices anyway, because you want to be able to isolate that data from the rest of your workflow. Um, we really, really want to have easy development integration. Usable security is incredibly important to us. Uh, this is why we also want simple deployment as well. And uh, everything that we do is standards based. So this is not a uh, write your application to uh, some new proprietary APIs. Uh, this is deploy using uh, existing standards. Cool. So um, to you sound great. Everyone wants them, okay? Um, but we do have some problems. Um, the first is that there are different platforms. So um, if you want to um, deploy on an Intel SGX um, uh, TE, you're going to have to um, develop and deploy in different ways because they're just different platforms. Uh, and that's, that's tricky and difficult. Um, so many of them require you to write your code uh, to follow a specific uh, SDK. Um, and we don't think that's good. We don't want you to have to only code in C or C++, for instance, or only in Java. Um, the other thing is that one thing we've not talked about is, is attestation. Attestation is how you prove that your workload is actually executing in one of these TEs, because it would be very easy for something to set up uh, a malicious host or whatever to set up something. Say this is definitely a TE. You're safe. You can you can put your uh, workload in here, but actually to do that maliciously. So um, the TEs um, provide attestation models, but they're all very different. And you shouldn't, as an app developer, need to understand all of this stuff. It's it's orthogonal to what you're trying to do, which is just write an application. Um, so that's really quite tricky. Then, of course, different vendors. We've already seen some vulnerabilities in some of these uh, these implementations. How do you know which to track, which are important to you, which are going to affect you? 
I just want to deploy workloads. So it was with these things in mind that we decided to come up with, uh, with the NARCS project. So on which technology do I build my application? Well, the answer, of course, is NARCS. So um, why don't you have a, a brief talk through this as well, and then we'll get on to the uh, demos in a couple of slides. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, so this is essentially what our architecture looks like. Um, as I mentioned before, we call our constrained areas keeps. And uh, basically, we have a separate keep implementation for each hardware technology. Uh, so these uh, basically deal with the specific CPU instructions and uh, make sure that everything is set up properly. And uh, our goal is to normalize this. So you can see that immediately above the hardware specific layer, uh, we are immediately jumping into WebAssembly, which is a, a normalized standard. So all of our applications run on, on top of this. You don't you have to worry about um, you know, everything else that's, that's under the covers. So uh, for looking from our WebAssembly layer and above, we have uh, WASI, which is the WebAssembly system interface. This is an upcoming standard from the W3C uh, that basically provides, uh, you can sort of think of this as um, you know, what uh, POSIX is to, uh, you know, to a uh, Unix syscall, uh, Web WASI is to WebAssembly. So these give you system calls that allow you to do uh, interesting bits of things. Um, and then above this, of course, we have all our language bindings. So this is not something that's provided by NARCS. Um, this would be whatever tooling is supplied um, with uh, whatever language you're coding in. For example, um, this would just be the uh, Rust target if you were programming in Rust. And uh, you would ins you know, install the Rust target for WebAssembly and just compile your application for that and you're off to the races. And then, of course, your, your application is on the top. So uh, the, the key bit here, of course, is that we want to normalize things so that they look the same as quickly as possible. And then uh, above that, you get a standard uh, environment to develop your application. So what you, what you want to do is you want to develop an application and it to run on both. You don't have to recompile it for the different types of thing you're running it on. Um, you want to be running the same application, the same binary. <laughs> Um, so it's demo time. I'll go through the first. We've got a, a few demos. They're, they're fairly short. Uh, I'll go through the first two or three and then uh, hand over to uh, to uh, Nathaniel to, to do some of the more detail. Oh, just to be clear, some of the sequences are shortened. Uh, that's because compiling takes a while. We sped the compiling up. Uh, apologies for that. But um, you didn't need to spend you know loads of seconds watching that. However, this is real gameplay. This is real uh, code that you can use right now. It's checked into our repositories, and we really want you to. So let's just remind ourselves. This is the setup we've got. We have we uh, want to protect our workload from the host OS and the, the and the more general uh, uh, environment of the host. So let's uh, let's start our first demo. I'll uh, make it as big as I can. Apologies if it's not huge. So um. First of all, we're going to clone our demo code. This is pretty simple. Um, <coughs> and we're going to uh, look at it. And so what this is, it's a very simple program um, which generates a, a random number. And it doesn't print the random number out until you press Enter. So you do this, and it's done it. We press Enter, and there we are. We have a random number. So that's, that's the very basic thing. And what you've just seen, in fact, is um is this we've got a, a secret generator as a workload in a standard binary so nothing particularly exciting but we want to show show you step by step so let's go to uh, to demo two which shows which goes just a little bit further so um we're doing the same thing we're cloning the demo um so we know what this looks like and uh, just to prove it's the same code i'm sure you can have remembered exactly what it was <clears throat> Uh, this time we're going to run it in a in a different way though. Um, so run it first off, and it's as you expect. But we have a secret. We talked about um, being able to um, compile to a different target. So this is how you compile your application, your Rust application, to uh, to to WASI, to to WebAssembly. It's literally this simple. It, you you use that target, and assuming you've got your environment set up, 
you have now um, you've now created a dot wasm file, which is uh, the uh, the binary uh, for it, and we're going to run it now. In a second, here we go, and um, you can compile to to WebAssembly from lots of different languages: C, C plus plus, Go, Rust, uh, Python, Haskell, uh, C sharp. Lots of different things. Um, and OK, we've just uh, built it. What we're also going to do now, actually, is not just run it straight. We are going to run it uh, via a, um, a, a loader, um, which we call the WASM loader, which is part of, the, of NRX. This is, how, this is all part of how, how we run it together. So what we're going to do is run this uh, binary through the WASM loader. So this is uh, what we're just doing here. And hopefully it's going to come up with a number. Yep. And then we can uh, enter. And there we are. What we've done, let me show you, is, um, is done exactly the same. We've got a secret generator. But now it's running not as a standard binary, but as a WASM binary. Um, and it's running via a keep loader, which is a, a piece that we've, we've written. Right. I'm going to take you, um, I'll take you through the third third demo briefly and then we'll pass over to Nathaniel. So you may have noticed when we um when we looked at that uh the original uh clone there was a something called secret search and this is an evil evil program uh which basically um once it has the uh the process id of your uh your running uh demo it tries to find the secret. It basically scans the memory to find something that looks like it's secret. And it's going to do it now. It's going to see if it can find the secret. It's going to look through the pages uh, associated with that, uh, that PID. And can it find the secret? Dot, dot, dot. Ah, oh, it's found something it thinks like a secret. Let's have a look on the left. And it has indeed found the secret. So what we've just seen is our secret generator and the secret search was able to look inside it and that makes us very sad we do not like this so this basically shows that in normal usage there is no isolation uh, of type 3 there's no workload from host isolation right and um, do you want to talk through uh, demo 4 so when it starts getting really interesting uh Nathaniel. sure so in uh, in demo four, we're basically going to do the th same thing that we have been showing all along, uh, which is the ability to uh, to scan the memory and find this secret. One important thing to note is that the reason why we don't reveal the secret until you press enter, uh, this is essentially your application security controls. So the vulnerability that we're seeing here is that the host can, through memory scanning, bypass the security controls of your application and uh, can access the secret. And um, this is this is part of everything we do in the cloud today, right? So this is this is just normal way that we operate today. We want to see if we can do something that is. Uh, a little different and gives us a stronger guarantee of security from that uh, third form of isolation. So uh, I can't actually see what's going on on the screen yeah, here, Mike, so, because yeah, I... what, we're, what we're running here is we're doing pretty much the same as we did before. So we're running it with nil, um, which means we're not giving it, making any attempts to improve things. And sadly, uh, as, as before, it was able to find it. What we're going to do now is run it is in a KVM. So do you want to talk about that? In the first example with K with the uh, with the nil backend, basically we're going to run this as a normal process, and uh, we don't get any protections. Now we're running it in KVM, and we're going to see if KVM provides us any additional protections. So right now, the, the, on the left hand side, you can actually see that that WASM code is running inside of a super tiny micro uh, virtual machine, and it is just KVM. But Bad you'll notice news, on the right, it's come up with it's, it's found the secret, Nathaniel. Yep. it's found. Yeah, it has. Sorry. But, and the reason Maybe for this, of help. course, the reason of this for this, of course, is that uh, virtual machines don't provide uh, this kind of isolation from the host. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn on uh, SEV mode. We're going to execute this using the SEV keep, and this is a, the technology from AMD, uh, which allows you to create an encrypted virtual machine. And so we are going to use this encrypted virtual machine to do uh, exactly what we just did in the KVM case. 
but this time we are really hoping that we don't find uh, any secret in this VM. So it's and running, it's looking. It is looking. And it's it's just returned. It, it doesn't seem to have found anything. Yep, and it didn't find anything this time because all of the pages uh, for this virtual machine are encrypted and uh, cannot be decrypted by the host. And this is guaranteed by the CPU and the CPU's firmware. Um, and so we've just run it again, just in case you wrote the code badly and it didn't find it second time. So it seems, uh, and there we are, we've seen it. So we saw it on the left to prove there actually was a secret. So what we see, and I'm not going to show all three cases because you've already seen the sort of nil case. We've seen uh, the KVM did not provide protection, but as soon as we put it in an SEV keep, we did provide protection. The secret search could not look inside it. Um, so this is pretty cool, right? Um, we're happy now on the left-hand side, but still very unhappy on the right-hand side. So we have one more demo uh, to show you, and um, let's. Uh, we're going to see something very, very similar, actually, but this time we're on a different machine. Uh, so I have bad yeah, problems so with the... Um, uh, this is not displaying very well. It's almost difficult. It's very difficult to read on my screen. I suspect you're having the same problem. Um, yep. Do you want to just talk I'm, through what it's doing anyway? I, I will. Yeah. So this time we are not running on an AMD box. We're running on an Intel box. And uh, in, Intel CPUs have a different technology called SGX. So we want to basically run the same application um, inside SGX. And we're showing it incrementally here as well. I, I believe this video does it incrementally where we it start does, off. It does again exactly with, the same. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's, so it starts off with the nil keep and we're able to find the secret. And uh, then we show it again, uh, executing in KVM on this Intel CPU. And uh, that's what it's doing right now. And I believe it's the search. We're it's doing our secret search, search on KVM. And we should still find the secret in this case. Yep. It's just about to find it, I think. I, I should say that this um, this presentation with just me talking on it um, is available um, if you go to our booth. And we'll be making it on the NARC's YouTube uh, channel uh, if you want to go and, uh, go and uh, look at it uh, there as well. So we did and, find okay, the secret. We're just creating a, a we're now doing a, a, a new one, an SEV one, I think. Uh, the SGX, yeah. SGX, so, and no, it, it's core dumped. Yep. So in, in this case, um, the the hardware profile of SGX is, is slightly different to the one in SEV. Uh, SEV will allow the host to read all of the pages, uh, but it can't decrypt them, where SGX uh, does not even allow access to the pages. So what happens on the right-hand side is that when we attempt to scan those memory pages, we actually get a core dump and we can't find the secret at all. And it's just core dumped again, uh, which is good news for us. Um, I'm really sorry, this, uh, the, the screen resolution is terrible. I don't know what's going on here, but um, okay. And we're just gonna see, yeah, there was a secret. So that's good. That's all That's all shown very nicely. So um, in this case, we've seen something very similar as, as we did before, but this is KVM. Again, it could look in. Uh, SGX, it couldn't look in. And again, we're happy. So we have just shown you a WASM file, so a, a, a WebAssembly binary running in a keep, in a trust execution environment on AMD and on Intel. Um, this is a really, really big step forward in the project. Um, so what I'm going to do hand now is, is hand over to uh, to Nathaniel for a bit of an architectural view. We want to leave space for questions, um, but we have loads of time. We, we're, we're doing well. So um, here's a chance, Nathaniel, to talk about uh, the specific details of, of the different types of keep. Sure. So uh, in this example here, um, we, uh, we this is roughly what um, everything looks like on all of our CPU architectures. In this case, it's it's Intel. Uh, and SGX. So we have, of course, our CPU at the bottom. This is our root of trust, and uh, we can validate this root of trust using attestation to prove to us cryptographically that that is the real CPU that is made by Intel and has set up our environment properly. Uh, above that, we have the host kernel and the uh, NARCS loader, the NARCS keep loader. 
And uh, these two bits are actively distrusted. So they uh, exist outside of the, the trusted domain. Um, but these layers are both um, silicon architecture dependent. So you're going to have, you know, a, a kernel built for uh, the Intel instruction set, for example, and uh, you're going to have a, uh, a loader that is built specifically for SGX. Um, the same is true with the shim. The, so the shim is a layer which adapts the specific hardware technology to be able to support um, a, a static Pi binary. And uh, so basically everything from the shim layer above looks exactly the same, both to NRX and the application, uh, where everything below from the shim layer and below is uh, is uh, architecture dependent. So once so here's, once you here's the key version. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is this is the yeah, same right. exact on uh, on an AMD CPU. You notice uh, that things are slightly different, but all the layers are the same. And uh, basically, once we get up into that WebAssembly and WASI layer, everything is is the same from that point on. Um, one important bit is to note that the, that NRX plans to distribute those four layers: the uh, the loader, the shim, the, and the WebAssembly and WASI layers. Uh, application is your responsibility, and of course, the the kernel is the cloud host's responsibility, uh, and the CPU is of course the CPU vendor's responsibility. Absolutely. And now we we've talked about Intel uh, S, SGX and uh, AMD SE, SEV. Those are the ones that are available at the moment. Um, we absolutely plan to support others as they become available. Um, <clears throat> so Intel has announced something called TDX. Uh, which we've already said that we we plan to support once we have hardware and as and when um, other chip vendors come out with uh, similar technologies, uh, we very much intend to support them and we we talk very closely to all of the major silicon vendors. Um, so one key thing that we didn't talk about particularly in the demo was that the binary we created was the same. The the compiled WASM binary is exactly the same. So you know if um, if you do, if you have a cloud or a bunch of clouds with um, with a variety of different um, chip architectures, you you don't care. You as the tenant don't care because NRX will deploy to whichever chip architectures are available and which fit the, your security policy, um, and you don't need to worry about it because, as far as you're concerned, it's you just. Your binary, your application will see just the same underlying uh, ha uh, hardware because of the abstraction that we perform. Um, so here we've got a, a brief, um, very sort of simplified uh, way of thinking about the different pieces that uh, that we we will be talking about. So. Um, on the right, we've got a client, and you might be using a CLI. You might be using an orchestrator like uh, Kubernetes, OpenShift, OpenStack. And there's an NRX client agent. And the NRX client agent knows how to talk to the pieces on the host. Um, and the NRX client agent is trusted. Uh, the NRX host agent um, involves things like the, the, the loader, which we've already said isn't trusted. But it helps uh, load the workload um, into the keep, although it never sees it itself. Um, the workload is always encrypted, data and uh, code, uh, until it actually runs in the keep. So the host agent can't interfere, can't see. Uh, worst it could do is refuse to load it. Um, and uh, you'd know about that because your application wouldn't be loading. Um, got a slightly more complex uh, view of this. Do you want to talk around this at all, Nathaniel? Small for my phone, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, fine. That's the problem you have with being at the lake. This um, <clears throat> this just goes into a bit more more detail. Um, and um, if anyone has any specific questions about the architecture, we can come back to this slide. Uh, maybe if we need to uh, need to discuss things in a, in a bit more detail. Um, so one final thing is we've talked about you know low level um, stuff. Or we we haven't talked about syscalls particularly but you know that's the business we're in we're in syscall territory we're in uh, you know low level uh runtime territory kernels and all those sorts of things but actually as a developer we don't want you to need to care about this we see enox as a deployment framework not a development framework 
you should be able to choose whatever language you want as long as you can it can compile to to, to uh, WebAssembly, and many of them do over forty already. You develop your application, you compile it, and then you've got um, a, a something that's ready to run. You can think of that as the equivalent of a, a a virtual machine image or a container image, something like that, or a jar file that you're ready to ship and deploy. And the stuff in Orange is is one set of steps, and then you hand that over. And you do the second set of steps, which is actually the deployment side, where you choose the host, uh, it's configured, and then it runs. So in an exa example, you might be using uh, dev tooling, which will, which will do your development uh, and uh, call, compile to WebAssembly, whether that's Emacs or uh, VS Code or uh, Eclipse Che or whatever. But it, it spits out uh, a WASM file at the end. <laughs> and then... Whenever you're ready, you can you can deploy. You might be using OpenShift alongside uh, the NARCS pieces, and you deploy into the IBM Cloud, Azure, AWS, whatever it may be, uh, Alibaba. Um, you can deploy what you want. We separate out these two things because that's one of the joys of the cloud and the, the way of thinking about cloud native is that you shouldn't need to think about or the, the, say, the different parts at the same time. So where are we? Um, why don't you talk about these design principles a bit, uh, Nathaniel? Sure. So as Mike mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we uh, have some very strong design principles. And these are essentially our uh, 10 commitments. So number one is that we want to have a minimal trusted computing base. That is the amount of code that is required inside of the keep uh, in order to make your application run should be as small as possible. This protects you as the tenant um, from compromises, and uh, it also allows you to have greater density um, for, uh, for your deployments. Uh, number two is that we want to have a minimum uh, number of trust relationships. And this is uh, who, who do you have to trust in order to deploy an application? And uh, from the NRC's perspective, you have to have two and basically no more. Uh, you need to trust the CPU and the CPU's firmware. Uh, we consider that as one trust entity since it comes from the same provider. And uh, the second one is that you need to trust the NRC's code base. Everything else uh, outside of that is, um, you know, it, it is libraries that you're bringing into your application or, uh, you know, is internal to your own application process. But you don't have to trust uh, many other people in order to get your application running in a way that, that's secure. So the third is that we care about deployment time portability. So we, uh, we basically want to make sure that once you've compiled and validated your, your application, that you can take that binary and you can deploy it across a number of CPU targets without having to go through any sort of redevelopment cycle. Um, <clears throat> number four, we want to make sure that the network stack is outside of the TCB. And the reason for this is that there are quite a number of vulnerabilities that have occurred um, historically on the network stack. Uh, in fact, if you look, um, you know, at the Linux kernel, for example, um, and really this applies to all kernels, um, but it's very oftentimes the network stack that provides the worst kind of vulnerabilities, um, it's some things like Heartbleed and such. So uh, we want that to be outside of the TCB. We want, um, we want to have security at rest in transit and in use. So we want to be protecting your data at all times, and this should be on by default. Uh, this means that when you are uh, when your application is actually running, it's uh, it's protected through the uh, hardware isolation. We also want to make sure that uh, your data is protected in transit uh, via uh, enforcement of encrypted channels like TLS and at rest with disk encryption. Um, six is auditability. We want our code base to be uh, easy to read and auditable. So uh, we want. Uh, we want basically to uh, allow people to be able to look into it and be able to have trust that we are doing what we are we say we are doing. Seven, of course, as always, we are open source. Um, that's that's never in question. Uh, eight, we we uh, are place heavy heavy emphasis on open standards. So again, you don't have to develop something to a proprietary uh, API. We just want to use standards for this. Um, nine, we have an emphasis on memory safety. This is protect, precisely why we chose WebAssembly and Rust as our implementation uh, tools. And 10, we're committed to ensuring that we will not place any backdoors in the project. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. 
Yep, yeah, absolutely. So um, last last slide before before questions is we are an open project. It's not just the code. The wiki is open. Our design uh, documents are open. Issues and PRs are all open. Our chat is open, hosted by Rocket Chat. Thank you very much indeed. Our CICD resources are open by Packet IO. Thank you very much indeed. We have stand-ups every day of the, uh, the the Monday through Friday. Anyone can turn up to those. You're very welcome. Uh, and we uh, we implement the Contributor Covenant uh, Code of Conduct because we believe very strongly in diversity and inclusion uh, in the project. Um, here's some information here. Um, the booth is open. There should be some uh, folks from the project uh, there if you're interested in chatting to them. Or you can just join us on our, on our chat, any point, chat.nelks.dev. It's pretty easy to remember. Uh, it's all Apache 2.0 license, and it's all in Rust. So with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to uh, see if we have any questions from uh, from anybody, and we'll try and answer those if we can. <clears throat> I don't see any questions in the chat. We can wait for a bit to see yeah, if wait, anything wait, appears. One second. Nathaniel, anything that we should be talking about that we haven't, we did rush, well, not rush through, but we, uh, there's only so much we can get on the slides. Anything we should have mentioned, do you think? Um, just, we would love to have people show up and uh, be a part of it, really. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. We're a pretty friendly group of people, and there's a really, really, uh challenging technical problems to solve and uh so it's in we think it's an interesting project to be a part of indeed it is um, i'm going to put a couple of uh of links into the um um into the chat um one is the uh the booth so if anyone wants to uh to join us at the booth they're very welcome to do so um uh, another one is our um, our chat, uh, which is there. And last but not least is um, nrx.dev, where you can uh, that'll lead you to our code and, in fact, all of all of the other information um, that that you might be needing. So, uh, yeah, as I said, there's uh, there's some folks I think willing, ready, and able to take your questions, or you're always welcome to join us in, in the chat. Uh, and we have a mentoring system as well. So if you want to get involved in the project um, and you're you know, a bit scared by the size of the code base or not sure how best to contribute because it's not all about coding, um, there's lots of other things to be done as well, then um, you can raise a an issue, a GitHub issue, which is a mentoring request. And we will find somebody... Uh, who will uh, come and um, and work with you to try and get you involved in the project? That seems to have worked very well so far. Um, we had a new person turn up today who uh, who came to a a, a talk uh, earlier in the week, which uh, she was interested in, and um, she is hopefully going to be starting a mentor mentoring request. Uh, so that's always always nice to have new people like that. I think that's great. Um, I really like the open source culture. I mean, uh, open standups and the mentoring yeah. thing. So, so anyone who wants to get in touch, um, there are links in the chat and then um, get in touch with these people. I think they're doing amazing work. Uh, and I really like the idea of Enox, like the third type of isolation that you talked about. I'm not from a security background, but um, learning about that was really fun so thank you for sharing um, all the cool work that you did you're very welcome thank you for for your attention everyone is this the last is there another um uh uh thing to today in the um in the track or is this the last last one this is the last one so we're done for the day after that. We have a comedy show and a show and tell party after this. So like, feel free to join that and it's going to be fun. So we well, hope to see you there. In my time, so I think I'm probably going to bed. But, um, <laughs> so thank you everybody for your attention, uh, for coming along. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to speaking to you and, and meeting on the project. Thanks a lot. I'm going to leave now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.